All right, we should be good. Should be good to go. All right, well, thank you all for coming out tonight. Uh, this is actually our second part to our discussion that we had last time on kind of maintaining and having a mineral collection. Like, what do people normally do when they have mineral specimens they go out and collect? It's not just about the thrill of the hunt. Out in the field, you actually end up bringing them back to your home, right? And you have a process of either cleaning them, labeling them, storing storage, so on and so forth. So the first time we talked about this, we talked about labeling your mineral specimens. What do you put on a label? How do you label? Different databases for labeling. And tonight we're going to be talking about something that everybody was interested in talking about last time, which was cleaning and preparing those mineral specimens. And so tonight, that's what we're going to be focusing on. This is actually a photograph um, of a scufflin acre amethyst uh, uh, specimen from Prospect, Virginia, near the Farmville area. And you can see here what I mean by before and after from the field and then bringing it back home and cleaning it up. So tonight, we're gonna to be talking a little bit about how to clean and then prep the specimens. I do have my friend Alex Bradley here tonight. He'll be with me. We'll be having a conversation back and forth. So at the end of the slides, you know, if you have any comments or you have any additional tips, that's what this is for. We did that with the labeling. That's what we encourage. So any additional comments, any tips, any suggestions, any experience that you have and would like to add in there, we're more than glad to do that. But for a lot of this, Alex and I will be talking back and forth as we go through these slides. So thank you, Alex, for being here and helping me out with this. Yep, no problem. So the things that we're gonna to cover tonight, first are gonna be field collecting tips. So things that are gonna be very important for you while you're out in the field to think about. So a lot of people, see cleaning and preparing mineral specimens as something that you do when you either get back home or you get into a controlled environment. But what we want to say is that it actually starts out in the field. It starts at the moment that you start collecting the specimen. Um, we're then going to talk about the initial cleaning phase. And for a lot of people, this is where they stop. They do the water methods or some sort of, you know, cleaning off the specimens using water. And that's where it normally goes from there. We're then going to talk about removing unwanted matrix because Let's be honest, a lot of the times these minerals do not come out of the ground the way we want them to. They come out as either a big boulder or in several pieces. So we're gonna talk about first removing that unwanted matrix. One thing that I know everybody's interested in, and there's a huge discussion uh, around is the concept of acids and using acids or chemical methods to clean off your specimens. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that. We're then gonna go and talk about stabilization and consolidation talk a little bit about the differences between those, repairing mineral specimens, uh, reconstructing mineral specimens. This gets into gray territory where people may not like, you know, reconstructed specimens, but we'll, we'll discuss that. Uh, and then post-cleaning maintenance. People sometimes think that once you clean a specimen, that's it. But if you have ever got a hold of an old collection that's full of dust, you know that cleaning specimens normally are a continual process. It's a little bit different, but it is a process that happens after you find it. And a disclaimer is that, unfortunately for Kathy that's here, <laughs> we're not going to be focusing on like the micro micro specimens. There's an entire discussion and multiple presentations that could be had about each one of these topics, right? But tonight we want to give you an overview. Some of the key things about cleaning and preparing minerals, uh, just bring you up to speed on different outlets that you can kind of engage and learn further. And so that's what we're going to focus on tonight. And we also want to be cognizant and aware that there are actually people that do this for a living, professional preparators. So the idea here is that we want to keep in mind what is the average person, the tools that they have at their house, the equipment that they have, and what they can do. And then kind of gradually increase with each of these uh, topics into some different tools and things that you could use if you want to get a little bit more sophisticated. And then, of course, this is a clamshell from Virginia Beach area from an old deposit. And again, this is what we want to see, right? We want to see these beautiful specimens that we see in a museum, but there's an entire process to get into there. So that's what we want to talk about. All right, so let's start in the field. We're not home. We're right there, and we're digging the specimens. So again, these are tips and things that we have learned and things that we consider when we're out in the field first. Sometimes it's better to do as little field prep as possible. What I mean by that is you want to be in a controlled environment to actually prep that specimen, break it apart, and try to get it out. So sometimes if you're able to, 
and you're near your vehicle or you have some sort of ATV or something, you get a rock down the mountain, sometimes it's okay to bring a boulder back down. But you don't always want to prep out in the field. So controlled environment is important. A lot of times people may want to clean off the clay out of the specimens. They may get really excited and want to see what they have. But you've got to remember, there's going to be this transition process from the field to your home. And the damage that can occur between that distance could be significant. So sometimes you want to leave the clay on your quartz crystals or things like that because it is a protective layer in a way. So it's not a bad idea to actually keep that on as you, get to your, as you wait to get back or into a controlled environment. And like I said earlier, you've got to ask yourself a big question. What am I able to carry back down? If you're up on a, on a large mountain and you have a backpack and maybe two satchels, especially for those out in Colorado, <laughs> you, you may not be able to bring back down a lot, a lot of materials. So you got to be very strategic and you got to know what you can bring back down before you even get to that thought process of what I can clean and what I can keep. If you can not extract something out in the field, if it's possible, and if you're not worried about it getting lost or something like that, then come back with better tools or extra hands. You can never replace a mineral specimen sometimes if you break it, right? These things take millions and millions of years to, to form. So if you can't and you're afraid of that, if you have the luxury, don't take it out then. Always be safe, always be prepared to, you know, come back and work on it. That may not be a luxury some people have, right? You may be somewhere where it may not be possible and someone else could come. But if you do, just think about that. Make sure you wrap the specimens properly. So <laughs> I was laughing at a video, I was talking with Alex, uh, when we were doing our earlier videos back in 2013 and we were doing a and relic hunting, we were out at Scufflin Acres and I saw myself had a box of amethyst crystals, I was throwing them on top of each other. <laughs> and I was like, wow, what we've learned from that time to now. And so be very careful when you're out in the field, don't throw things on top of each other. We recommend, um, Flats like Coca-Cola flats is something that we always bring out if you have that space. Uh, you can just get cardboard beer flats or something from a local convenience store nearby. They're always happy to give those away because they're going to throw them away anyways. Um, or bread crates is another thing that we use out in the field to actually prevent that damage because if you can prevent the damage on this side of things, you don't have to worry about it later. I also sometimes talk about bring the pocket home. And what I mean by bring the pocket home is sometimes if you find a really nice deposit or, or a specific pocket of crystals or something and you're wanting to piece that back together at a later date, one, keep them separated from everything else that you're collecting because it's going to be very, very difficult later on to put it back together or to repair it. And sometimes it's okay to pull all the pieces together if you have that space because they may be valuable. You don't want to lose a puzzle piece because... For those of you that like to do puzzles, if you lose a puzzle piece, that's the worst feeling ever, isn't it? <laughs> when you don't have that puzzle piece. So just be very careful when you're out in the field. And this is something that we thought about a lot when we were going out. Utilize lesser quality specimens for testing. So if you're going to be doing acid treatments, you're going to be trying out different methods and techniques. If there's lesser quality pieces out in the field, don't just throw them away. They could actually be very useful for determining how will a specimen react to a specific acid. So for instance, we'll have some photos here in a second about um, the garnets that we found in Bedford County. They will turn cherry red and ruin when you put them in acid. So you use the lesser quality pieces to actually help you later down the line not ruin the nicer specimens, which is very crucial. And then it's very important too that you always use plastic and wooden tools when you're dealing with specimens, especially. I've seen so many times people go out and they bring metal picks, metal tools out in the field when they're trying to extract a specimen and that's just gonna damage them. We love to use wooden shish kebab sticks. That's a great thing to use, especially when you're working with quartz veins, very, very useful. That doesn't mean that you can't use a metal tool on like the matrix, but you gotta be very, very cautious. So there's a lot of great plastic shovels that you can buy at Walmart for like a dollar, a little trough and a little shovel, and that works perfect. Um, so that's just something. So we always say when, when you're when able, use those plastic and wood tools. I see people all the time with metal shovels and things, and that could just do a lot of damage. 
Um, and, and when it's dirty in the field, you don't see that damage, right? It's covered in mud. So if you're out in the field and you're thinking, I'm going to clean this later, it may be too late, right, when you clean it. So just think about that in the back of your mind when you're out in the field. Uh, this specimen here is not from Virginia, it's from North Carolina, but this is a broader topic tonight, so I included some outside things. This is a barrel specimen from the Ray Mica mine down in North Carolina. And um, you can see here that we busted this boulder open and we saw the barrel specimen. We were high up on the mountain, so we made the decision to break it apart the best that we could, try to control the environment the best that we could there, and then bring it back down in a smaller piece. But sometimes you don't want to do that, right? Um, but in this case, there was a lot of different fractures, a lot of different things, and we just wanted to bring it back down. So, again, is there anyone that has any specific field tips or anything that they want to include? And if there's anything Alex would like to include that I forgot on the field tips. Yeah, real quick, I can just speak to that specimen because it's a good example. Um, a lot of these points. Um, I, my training is with fossils. I'm a paleontology student. and um, I'm a big fan of minimizing spe uh, field prep. So any kind of preparation of specimens that you do in the field. Um, I would prefer to just make sure the specimen is stable and get it back home in a controlled environment where I can then actually prepare the specimen. Um, but like Thomas says, you have to be flexible and you have to be creative and um, choose your battles. In this case, at, at Real Mine, or sorry, Ray Mine, um, we were up the side of a mountain there. It's not a crazy hike, but it's no fun to bring back backpacks full of these, these big chunks of pegmatite. And so this barrel specimen was right in the middle of one of these chunks. And it already had existing cracks going around it, which you can see in that, in that lower left picture there. There's a little hairline crack right up against the specimen. And so we made the decision to remove a lot of that matrix and just carry the specimen back home. Um, it's, it's a controlled process. I'll talk a little bit more later when we get to the, to the um, tools. You're not just busting pieces apart. There is a way to sort of strategically remove pieces that you don't want. Um, but like Thomas said, it's important, I think, to minimize this stuff and to use soft tools because a lot of the damage to specimens, the really small damage particularly, a little ding tip on a quartz crystal that would make a perfect specimen otherwise, that happens in the field and you don't notice it because the specimen's dirty, it's covered in clay. You only see it when you get it home and you take that clay off. And a lot of that can be prevented if you're just aware of how the specimen is behaving right from the start. Thank you, Alex. Is there any, I know there's a lot of field collectors here and they may want to chime in. Yeah, guys, the other thing is, I noticed in your presentations, you guys collect a lot of little uh, points and stuff like that of quartz and all that so I mean egg cartons and things like that are really great for those and then that really cheap toilet paper at the dollar store that nobody knows what it's for that's actually <laughs> meant to wrap minerals so if you have flats and a lot of little points you can lay out layers of toilet paper put a layer of points put another layer of toilet paper another layer of points and you can you can store a whole lot of small pieces without you know getting damaged um, by doing that for very little cost and your that's best wooden tool is called a stick <laughs> yeah. yeah, shish kebab sticks or skewers. Um, one no, a stick off a tree. Uh, <laughs> You're in yeah. the forest, break a branch, pick a branch up off yeah, the ground and use that to... to There's a lot out. of shish kebab <laughs> sticks that are very thin and they'll break easy. There's some smaller ones that are, I don't know, maybe they're not a shish kebab stick there, but you use them as a skewer. Little but they, yeah, the little bamboo and they're, they're thick enough that they don't break and they've been very successful. Yeah, but sticks when you don't have it, very, very, I always bring a knife with me, of course, right, as a typical thing. And chopsticks with the points. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a bit. You get the chopsticks with the, the points desert. rather than the flat ends. Those work really well, and they don't break as easily. Yeah. If you go to the international stores, you get these um, bamboo sticks, and they're for cooking in deep pots in Asia, and they're like three feet um, long, and they're about the size of your pinky, and that's what I like to use. Super sturdy. Mm -hmm. You can actually get those here in Iowa. They sell them in some of the stores here, I've noticed. Okay. So, which is weird, but one thing too I can add is that um, I've never seen anybody do it with minerals, um, but we did this with fossils during field work. Um, 
is wrap it in something like toilet paper or paper towels and then in aluminum foil you can wad it up and the aluminum foil keeps everything in place and you got a nice little little bundle for it you can bounce those specimens around really delicate fossils and they'll be fine that's a good point should work with minerals too i don't see why not i, I was going to add something about uh minimizing field prep um, what I like to do in spots where I have easy car access and I don't want to waste a whole bunch of time doing field prep. If I know, if I know the material, I know the site, I load up uh, large pieces that I think have a pretty good chance of having something cool inside. Just load them all in the car and prep them at home. And, you know, I can do that in the comfort of my AC with my fancy tools. I don't need to do that in the hot sun. Exactly. Well, I think there's a lot of similarities, and we'll talk about this too, between paleontology and mineral prep when it comes to certain, you know, core fundamental aspects regarding that. Because you probably could do that with fossils too, don't you, Casper? Well, I was talking about fossils there, but the same <laughs> thing applies to minerals. Yeah. I mean, I've oh, done yeah. minerals I too. I was going to say, um, so I work on trilobites, and some of the best trilobite specimens that you see what they find in the field is a chunk of rock that has a tiny little piece of trilobite exposed. They just take the whole rock back and that's what I do. They, they don't crack it out. They don't do anything yeah. in the field really. So yeah, if you're doing any etching with minerals too, um, you know, mm -hmm. if, if there's a decent chance of it having something, just take the whole thing, etch it at home. Or it. Yep. So, so the main point here is that start to think about cleaning and preparing minerals is something that you, you start to imagine in your head from the second you're out there. So what we always say is that you should be constantly thinking about or at least be aware about the condition from the time you're digging and the time you finish, right? So always keep that in the back of your mind. So let's get into the first part, which are the mechanical methods, or just kind of these hand techniques and different tools that you can use. So the tried and true method, very simple, right? Brushes, water. This is the the golden ticket for a lot of people, right? It's, it's, it's tried and true, it's something that works. And so for a lot of situations, using a brush, using your tools, that's simple just as these, that's gonna be as useful in a lot of ways, right? You may not need additional techniques or you may not need to go any further, but this is something that's very useful. I always say as far as some tips regarding this uh, thing is that I always like to keep the water clean, especially if I'm working on certain pieces because if you start having a lot of little pieces fall down the bottom and then you're and then you're cleaning multiple specimens and something breaks off now you've got all these pieces in the bottom and you don't know which one to pick so always think about that instead of just cleaning all your specimens in one pot of water maybe and you, you can even sift it if you want to save and conserve water because i understand that's a concern right so you can try to get all the bits out and then put that back in there um, toothbrushes are fantastic as you can see i probably have a thousand um, I probably have more of those than I do actually in my house to actually use for my teeth. So, you know, never use the ones you use for your teeth, but I think that's self-explanatory. <laughs> probably done that before we're out camping, but you got to use what you got to use, right? Um, uh, Tom, <laughs> I have I have this toothbrush holder in, in the like downstairs basement bathroom, and I keep a toothbrush for cleaning rocks in there. And if anyone is ever using our guest room, I'm going to have to put that thing away so they don't <laughs> mistake it for something. <laughs> Well, that, well, we always, you know, instead of buckets and, and stuff, how many times, Alex, did we just use sinks? Uh, which is probably not the best thing to use, especially for your drainage and everything, but you got to be very well, careful. Make but... sure it has a P-trap. Yeah. yeah speaking <laughs> of toothbrushes, the other thing that works really well is, you know, those little plastic teeth cleaners that have like a little bristle on one end and the oh, yeah. dental floss on the other? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Those, you can get into a lot of really tight spaces with those, and it's plastic, so it's usually softer than the mineral you're working with. That's good. I never thought about that. Yeah. Are you talking about like the handheld ones or ones that actually go on like a toothbrush, but you can put them on the tip or just yeah, the little handheld ones, okay. you know, the little teeny tiny ones are U shaped on one end with the point. Okay. Yeah. I know what you're talking about now. Yeah. Now we also have a smaller, like a shoe brush or something like that. That works really well. I love, and a, and a fan favorite of mine is this um, kind of larger brush with the handle on it. It's great for, oh, I see you brought the toothpick there. Oh, floss. Yeah. Um, that you can actually have some sort of direction with it. Again, the thing though is that you always got to keep in the back of your mind how fragile the specimen is. You don't want to use something with a lot of brick bristles that are going to break up the specimen. So just be very cautious with that. 
I always say use a white towel or use something that makes sense for the specimens you're working on because you also don't want to lose pieces right then and there. Uh, again, these may be very small pieces, but they may be key components <laughs> later on. Um, that goes with fossils as well, especially. Um, mechanical toothbrushes, I've used those. It just gives a little extra oomph, but still something that could be useful as well. But um, again, these are the tried and true, very basic, but this is, a, you know, this is something that most people have access to and most people use. Moving up, you get to the water hose and the pressure water. Very simple, right? Again, we're, we're going to basics here. For the water hose, I always love the 10 and one nozzles because since it has various types of, you know, pressure and, and streams, you can actually pressure wash or pressure something and then just wash off the specimen. So there's a lot of different things. So I always like to have the 10 in one. I think it's very useful compared to just the normal water hose. You always have to be very careful though, coming from your hand, your toothbrushes, the power of these. You do not want to break off pieces. You do not want to send something flying. And especially with the power washer, you don't want to put a rock on the ground, shoot it, and then that thing goes across your pavement, and now you've got a thousand beings on it. So always be careful. We, again, utilize the Coca-Cola flats sometimes, and maybe even a mat to kind of keep the specimens in place so they don't vibrate a rock. And then start from a distance and then get closer so you can gauge how much pressure you need versus starting close and then destroying the, the specimen. So I would say distance matters. Uh, and of course, unlike your previous hand tools, there's a lot less control here, right? So if you're not careful, you can damage a piece. Yeah. And this is my favorite tool of all, the textile cleaning gun. If there's one thing you learn tonight or one thing you learn about and that you've never seen before, you got to have one of these. You have to have to have one. Buy one, buy two, buy three. These are the golden ticket for preparing and cleaning or cleaning up your mineral specimens. It's like a handheld focused water pressure or a pressure washer, but a very, very small, small beam gets in all those little tough cracks that you can't get with a toothbrush or something else, or even with a water hose. And it's perfect. It's used in basically clean. I think for printing shirts, you can like wash out in case you mess up or something like that. Um, so it's used in that regard, but very useful for mineral collectors. Um, it, it ranges in price from around $60 to $100. You want to be very careful that you get a good one. <laughs> they, they break pretty frequently. They're a little bit finicky. Uh, that seems to happen a lot. But just like before, distance matters. Start from a little bit back, maybe two and a half feet, and then get closer. Make sure you're not damaging that specimen. And again, as always, test these things on the lesser quality pieces so you don't mess up and break a really, really nice specimen. So don't try any of these techniques first with, you know, the higher quality piece. Um, okay, I see that uh, we have a comment here that they use a high volume, low pressure paint gun from Northern Tool that works well, less expensive. Yeah, so there's a lot of different devices that work like that. And I think I've seen something like that before. And I think you could probably do it with that and I do it with this one too. You can actually put some additional cleaners in it or some additional maybe low level acids or diluted acids to help out with the cleaning process. Nothing that's gonna destroy the, <laughs> The, the machine itself, but you can include some other sorts of liquids in it to help the cleaning process. Yeah, and you be very careful with your eyes as well, as well and have gloves. It can sting, it will definitely sting. Um, but it's, it, this is very useful for clay removal, very, very useful for clay removal. I see Kelly says she used an old water pick. Yeah, hey, whatever works, if it has enough pressure. I, I've seen some pretty crazy water picks, it's surprised it doesn't blow out your teeth, um, but, but that definitely works. Yeah, I, oh, we use we uh, use our dentist a lot. We, we went to a dentist and he got the new sonic cleaner and we, we got his, the old one from him and we use that to clean. The one they use for oh, yeah. getting down heavy cleans and all their old picks and everything. They have to throw them away after a certain number of uses and most dentists don't mind giving them to you and yeah. they're a great source for free toothbrushes. Interesting. Yeah. yeah hey, that definitely would go. Go check out your local dentist then <laughs> when you're there, yeah. I guess. The other thing is, is, um, with the water guns, if you have a hard time holding things, which I have problems with vibration, um, most of these guns and things, you can suspend them with a, like a bungee cord and that'll take some of the pressure off, but then you're having to hold the specimen more to direct it, um, but it does work. 
And most of them will also take a hose. You know, you can connect a hose instead of a water bottle connector if you want to do that. Yeah. I don't think we've heard, we never did that, did we? I never did that. No. Well, I can say that, um, well, so if you're, if you're completely unfamiliar with these high pressure water techniques, this does the job of a brush, but way better because it can get into any nook and cranny. You're just spraying water on the specimen and you're pushing water through the specimen as well. So um, one of the advantages that, you know, these are high power, high pressure devices, but because the nozzle is so limiting to get that high pressure, um, there's, there's a, um, there's a strong correlation between the power and the distance from, from the stream. So the farther you get away, it immediately drops off and gets very, very gentle. So if you've got a really delicate specimen, you can still prepare it with something like this if you're just holding it far enough away. And you wanna be careful of that obviously, but um, you get the most power only a few centimeters away from, from the nozzle and then it tapers off immediately from there. And the same is true for full scale power washers. And these are also good to complement with your original just water and brushes. Some people may want to clean it off initially and then use this for the tough cracks. So this is something that complements the earlier techniques that we just talked about. And then here is a specimen of sphalerite that you can see came from an old collection. That's the dust, right? So the post maintenance issues there, uh, post cleaning, I guess, issues. Um, but there you go. You can see how well it, you know, shines up that specimen from that before and after just with water. You know, it's pretty incredible. And sometimes, too, if you have surface coatings or like thin layers of calcite or something and you don't want to use acid, you could actually sometimes, if it's a quartz crystal, break that off with these things. There's enough pressure, especially if the piece is solid enough. So it could actually do some of that initial work for you without using an acid. Yeah, and these are, uh, what, 40 to, or 60 to $100? 60 to $100. I would say check and see. Does anyone have a brand they recommend or that they use because... I know that we go back and forth. A lot of them are made in China, but they're, again, quality depending. But a lot of times you have to buy them on eBay. <laughs> Some rock shops sell them, but at a higher price, for sure. All right. So the last thing as far as the cleaning and the water method here is an ultrasonic cleaner. Now, this is where you get into a little bit of money, right? So again, we kind of start from the basics and, and rank our way up to whatever you're willing to afford and whatever you're willing to do. It's very, very useful. It uses the vibrations and the frequencies to basically clean off the specimens and, and jiggle around the specimens within it. There's there are several different sizes. It's best known for cleaning jewelry, right? The smaller ones. Um, but you can get larger tubs. Of course, the price exponentially increases the larger the bin you want to get. But I would like to ask a question. Does anyone use smaller jewelry ultrasonic cleaners for small specimens? Because you may not be able to put a lot in one, but you can put one specimen. Does anyone have any experience with like the smaller ones? Mm. Nope. Well, we, we don't I, normally, we don't have any experience with the ultrasonic cleaners. I know that several people that I know use them and I've been there around these devices and have used them. But you can do a lot of what this would do on the other techniques, right, with the, the textile cleaning gun and everything. So you don't really need this. But there are situations where it may be very fragile or it may be worth checking something like this out. But it, it comes at a price, right? So that's just something you got to keep in mind. Um, the one on the, the left is actually on Amazon, and it's $33. doesn't mean it's good, right? <laughs> but they, they, do, they do exponentially increase. So it could be hundreds of dollars, $1,000 just depending on the size that you're wanting. Um, but again, normally for jewelry, but you can do smaller single specimens in some of the smaller containers, which is more price effective, I guess. So for these things, they, they kind of do what the, what the cleaning gun does, except that you're not gonna blast bits off and lose them across the room. So that's, a, that's one advantage of these. Uh, like Thomas said though, me and him, we're not very experienced with, with these tools, but I know the basics of what they're used for. I, I had one that I killed. Um, water start, water, water spilled out and fried the electronics. Oh no! <laughs> but that's okay because it never did anything for me. I never really got much use out of it. Um, we used um, ultrasonic cleaners quite a bit at the start when we first started cleaning the fluoride from the Rogerly, and we were using it with water and a low dose of um, um, muriatic acid, okay. and 
it really didn't do much. The water gun was a lot more efficient until we could get it back to the states and really tackle it in, uh, you know, in the work environment. Um, but we, I don't really, I haven't seen much of a use for them. Um, yeah, so I, it is one of those things that, and I think it probably, and that goes back to like the field thing too, is that, and then Casper mentioned this earlier, earlier you, knowing the location of like where you're going to, you can kind of get a sense after you've collected there enough what works and what doesn't work on those type of specimens. And if you go on MINDAT, and we'll talk about this, I highly recommend checking out the message forms. If you come across an old collection and there's some famous key localities and specimens from those localities, there's probably a lot of people who've suffered from the same issues you may suffer from and will have already found the best devices, the best techniques, the best solutions to get to the desired outcome that you want. So yeah, so some localities may be useful, some not. I do know that for the barger cori or barger cori pyrites, I've seen them cleaned up in an ultrasonic cleaner before, which is interesting. Um, but again, you can accomplish that with other devices, so it may not be worth that money. Two things with the ultrasonic cleaners. Um, I've got that and the water gun. Um, ultrasonic cleaners, there's, um, you have to be careful with putting in uh, not very well consolidated minerals because they will become very unconsolidated after that and they, all of a sudden you have nothing left in the basket. It's all laying in the bottom. Also too on the more powerful units, you're supposed to make sure that you turn them off because if you put your hands in there, they can break capillaries in your fingers, I've heard. I don't, wow. haven't tried that, but some of the more powerful ones can. So, um, but same thing you guys said with the water guns and just bringing the distance back, you know, uh, there's, you can be so gentle with those or you can just literally blast right through a specimen with the water guns. They are, that's the way to go. And for a hundred bucks, you can't beat it. So. Yeah. That's the best tool, I think, out of everything. <laughs> it's the best, it's the one thing. So if you buy one thing tonight after this, definitely get yourself a water gun. I mean, a textile cleaning gun. Remember very, earlier he said, bring back the, we call it lever right. I don't know what you guys call it here, but you know, the, the stuff that's not so good. Practice a lot on that with your water gun before you go after a mineral you want, a specimen that you want to keep. Because it, I mean, there is a little touch to it that you have, you have with practice, you'll get very good. Um, but you don't want to you don't want to ruin your good stuff before you uh, before you get handy with it. Yeah, yeah. I see Pam in the comments that they're used for jewelry. Um, I've always been kind of skeptical of how much oscillating power you can get out of just some just a tank of water. So I don't know if these some of you who have used these if they do very well in dislodging pretty stuck on material or if for those situations you kind of have to use the gun. With uh, like Franklin, New Jersey rocks, a lot of those that come from the dump are pretty notoriously covered with manganese oxide coverings. Um, you throw them in an ultrasonic cleaner, it'll take off a little bit, but you take them and put them under one of the uh, textile cleaning guns, especially if it's something like a Hendrixite specimen, which you know is more of a micaceous type uh, surface. A lot of times it'll literally blow the plates right off and you have a fresh faces exposed. Um, that's where those textile guns, especially if you work with the uh, cleavage planes on the minerals, um, pay attention to what you're working with and uh, it can actually uh, work with you. So it works pretty well for me. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Yeah. Sure. I, 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 like I said, we didn't have much experience. I know several people that use it and I've been around these ultrasonic cleaners, but again, the usefulness, it really comes back to that price and is it worth spending that money on it? Like if, I would say get three textile cleaning guns versus an ultrasonic cleaner at that rate, right? So, you know, uh, that's a good point. And I never thought of it. <laughs> It'd be interesting to see, and I'll have to read more about the capillary thing. That, that would be interesting to look into that. Or, or but, if, you have, um, if you have another use for it, so if you make jewelry and you collect rocks, that could maybe justify it. Yeah. That's what I yeah. like to do. Find two purposes, buy something. If it doesn't work for one, hopefully it works for the other. Yeah. Money. And so the point here is what should we be doing after this? Should we just stop? So you have to ask yourself a question at this stage. Do I need to do anything else? Do I need to do any further cleaning? Do I need to even worry about asses? Do I even need to worry about removing the matrix or anything like that? So at this phase, a lot of people sometimes will end up finishing and they'll be like, I don't really need to worry about uh, that anymore. So. So let's go on to the second part here. 
removing unwanted matrix, or in this case, also exposing the specimens, right? Because again, like I said, it's not always the case that these things come out the way you want them to come out. There's sometimes a pain, they're sometimes difficult. I use this example here because this is a perfect one. This is from the 2019 Green Giant Discovery at the Dale Quarry, part of the Richmond Club. And um, I don't know if you, can you see my cursor? Yeah. Uh, this specimen here is 11 and a half inches. But you don't see 11 and a half inches there, right? It's all deep and then this pegmatite boulder. And this piece was huge. It was a ton, probably more. And we had a couple hours to get this thing out before we were out of the quarry. So this is that situation where you said in the field, you're limited on time, you're limited on size, what are you gonna do, right? So it's one of these situations where you gotta get some of that matrix off. So there's some different techniques that you can do in the field and some you can't. So again, let's go start from the top, the, top, the tried and true methods, right? Let's start with looking at our hand tools. So there's a ton of different tools that you can utilize, a ton of different devices. People have their preference. People have hammers that fit their hands really well and other hammers that don't. So you've got to be sure that, you know, what the tools you're working with works well for you. Some key tools that I really like are a three pound hammer, this little small hammer, as you see right here, some various size chisels, of course, depending on the situation, some smaller ones, some skinny ones, some wider ones, depends on the size. You can get some really nice small ones for some of the smaller specimens. Um, I'll be honest, and Alex and I were talking about this earlier. <laughs> I, I'm not a really big fan of the geo picks, especially because they don't have enough oomph to do a lot of the work out in the field. They're good for actually using it as a pick, but not much as a hammer. So the three pound hammer is a great, place to really start gauging that. So I always say a three pound hammer is very, very important to have out in the field as, far as, as well as a smaller hammer. Now for chisels, um, the best place to find chisels without going to a store and spending a lot of money are yard sales, are antique, you know, uh, there's a, I can't think of it, it's the yard crawl goes down parts of 81 and something like that. And uh, there's a lot of different antique shops, a lot of different places. And sometimes you'll find that yard sales, there's farmers selling tons of chisels, probably better quality than what you're getting in the store right now, for sure. Um, but you can go find a lot of really good things. A lot of these chisels are also, of course, not meant for busting open minerals and stuff, but you can utilize some different forms. You can see there's a little chisel set here. Some of them make sense, some of them don't make sense. Um, but again, going out to these yard cells are going to be the best way to do that. Um, you'll notice that we're using metal tools here. <laughs> I said don't use metal tools. But again, this comes back to the matrix, right? Be very, very careful, very coordinated with your strikes. Um, and so I'll hand it over to Alex because Alex is a very well experienced flint napper. So he is very useful to have out in the field when we're, we're busting open and removing matrix with these hand tools because you got to be very, very direct. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I guess I'm a professional breaker of things. Um, I, well, I, just to play devil's advocate for the, for the geology hammers. Um, yeah, I suck as hammers, and I, I, I gave myself permanent nerve damage with one, um, which was my own fault. But at any rate, um, they're basically chisels with a handle, so I do like using them, stick them in a crack, and then smack the end with the hammer and use that to remove things. But at any rate, um, if it, this comes with experience, it cannot be explained. You, you, you just sort of get at it and you learn what works and what doesn't work. But like Thomas said, this is all about control and breaking and exploiting fractures in a controlled manner. It, it's not about just haphazardly smashing on something. Um, for example, the field work that I do for my research currently, we go out to the desert and we quarry limestone, which contains fossils. And we always bring, we call it Thor, we always bring this huge big sledgehammer for busting up particularly hard chunks of limestone. And it's really not necessary. You can do, uh, with one of these three pound sledges, you can do what a, what a much larger hammer can do, as long as you're being strategic about it, and as long as you're paying attention to how the material's behaving. Um, in a lot of cases, your matrix is going to be what's called conchoidally fracturing, meaning it 
breaks like glass and it breaks in a predictable manner. Um, so if you've got a hard uniform matrix, uh, there you can smash it with a hammer in a way that it does not affect the part you want to preserve. And always be cognizant of cracks, always be looking for fractures. As you're hammering on something, you're gonna produce dust and that's gonna obscure what you're looking for. So be watching the specimen, blowing off the dust, looking for cracks that develop. You can exploit some of those, but sometimes you wanna avoid them. Um, it just comes with experience. Um, but yeah, the, this is one area where we're at a bit of an advantage as rock hounds, like Thomas said, is that you can go to yard sales and estate sales to get these things because they're usually meant for woodworking. And once something becomes no longer useful for woodworking, because maybe the edge isn't quite sharp enough, uh, it's still perfectly useful for, for rock working. Uh, <laughs> so you can go get, I, I've got a whole uh, box that I take with me in my car, just full of chisels and files and things that I get from, from yard sales that you can just use for this purpose. Um, and Harbor Freight is another great resource. Um, I get, we get these little hammers, these little Pittsburgh hammers from Harbor Freight, and I love those. They're very well balanced. And um, I've actually been able to flint nap with that little hammer there before. Uh, one of these days I'm going to complete an actual uh, tool with those hammers just to prove the point of how controlled and how nice they are. We, we found that, what, like Harbor Freight the first time, and we thought it was yeah. a little cheesy thing, and then we were like, wow, this is great. And like, ever since, we're like, this is a must-have. So this would be another thing, I'd say, out of three-pound hammer, and then this smaller Pittsburgh hammer would be something that I would highly recommend for hand tools. Yeah, and I use it for silversmithing, too, just to throw that out there. It's, it's, a, it's small, but powerful, and very controlled, and very well balanced, so... So let's talk about trimmers. Uh, this is something that you may not have seen before. This is something that I had never seen before until I went to Andy's house. Um, they're hard to find, but again, it's one of those things that when you join clubs and you find older members, they may have these. Clubs may have access to these devices, but a lot of geology departments also do. It is a Zuber, Casper. It is a Zuber. Or, or you probably say it a lot better than I do. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah, you got it. Okay, Zuber. So this is a Zuber. And um, these are very useful because if you're looking for a next step up beside your hand tool with less control and you need to be very precise, this allows you to almost have some really great precision on controlling those breaks. Um, again, you have a size limit, as you can probably see here. You get to a big enough size, it becomes impossible to do it within one of these things. You see like three different sizes here, one large, medium, and small. Um, but it's a great way to work with smaller pieces or remove excess matrix on other pieces. Um, again, you can find these at rock swaps and different things like that. But it's a next step up from your, your hand tools. And so I, I love this. We were using it the other day at Andy's house. It's perfect. The only problem here is that you have to be very, you have to have a great surface in order to get the proper angle to actually get some grip to it. So sometimes they end up not being useful if you can't get a good grip. So Useful when they are useful, not so useful when they're not, you know, th th no better way to say it. You know, there's certain situations where they work really well and others where they don't work at all. Does anyone have experience with this? I mean, how, how do you, are they still for sale, I guess, is the question. You can still get them. Do you know yeah. where? You can also find plans on the internet to build them. Oh, okay. I, I have a Zuber. Also, I mean, this, you got to be really careful when you use it because... I mean, it's a tremendous amount of pressure and those shields are there for a reason. And some people are like, you know, to get in a hurry. And when the pieces come flying off that, um, yeah. Do the shields it take, come with it normally? Everything. Sorry? Do the shields normally come on it for the safety purposes? Or do you have to put yes. shields? Yeah. Okay. But if you're getting them, they can be there. Sometimes I put towels yeah. over it to kind of keep it, you know, from breaking around. So maybe put a towel if you don't have a shield. Idea. Yeah, so you can put a towel, wrap it around it. Yeah. That also prevents it from if you have a specimen where it may break off and then it may fall down and chip. You don't want to do that either. So yeah, you wrap it around it. Look, Kathy says she uses it for micros. So we've given Kathy something. <laughs> we've, we've provided Kathy with some information on usefulness for micro specimens. That's kind of amazing. I, I was going to say, I only use them on very rarely, and it's only on pieces that are, say, 
hand size or maybe a little bit yeah. more than hand size for, for yeah. me. Below four inches if you can help it. Yeah. yeah so, part, of, yeah. part of our collection is smaller pieces of pieces that are now in the Minrec and all that because she, my wife worked as a trimmer um, being trained and she had, a, she got to keep all the pieces that were trimmed off the pieces that are now in the wow. Smithsonian. And wow. we, we have a collection of the, the other piece. <laughs> hey, hey, that, that's really cool. Do you, do you keep yeah. the references and the photographs of the other specimens with them? Uh, no, but I should. I know, you know, like where they went and what happened to them and that kind of thing. That's so I, yeah, I should be documenting. A that. lot of that's confidential work for private collectors who don't display their piece. Sure. Um, so we can't do that with a lot of them. Yeah. Sure, sure. That's really, really cool. But yeah, they're very useful when they can be useful, but sometimes, you know, it's a size thing here. I'd definitely be careful with those with safety wise too, because uh, um, Professor Arthur Montgomery did so much with Pennsylvania mineralogy. There is a reason he didn't have a finger and it was from one of the uh, medium to large trimmers. So. Well, we thought we, we have a safety or a safety slide, a safety comments on the acids. And we were talking with, you know, earlier, we're like, you know, we could probably put that with every slide. <laughs> More of the story is uh, do these things with people that probably done it first. Uh, talk with your local club. That's a benefit of joining clubs, right? is having people and the benefit of coming to these things, right? To be able to meet people from other areas where you can listen and hear about specific techniques. So some of these things, yeah, there's always the safety component. There's always the thing. So that's a really good point because, uh, yeah, <laughs> you don't want to lose a finger or lose an eyeball. All right. So let's go over to the saws, which is something that's very common, especially for slabbing and stuff. Now, um, you know, I didn't, I, I, we had a conversation about, did I want to include like cabbing machines? And Cause you know, that's a way to prep, right? But we wanted to focus more on the mineral specimens here instead of, but, but this is also something useful for taking off larger pieces of matrix for mineral specimens, right? Um, so you can get various saw sizes, right? They come in all sizes and shapes. Uh, so you can get all the way down to like, I guess what, four inches really for some of the tile saws and stuff. But if you go look at some of the large marble quarries in other countries, they have giant, you know, saws. Um, I think most people, when you start looking at the oil saws and stuff, they're probably, what, around 24 inches up to 32 or something? I mean, normally in the 20s, right, is the normal range for these saws, um, for the bigger ones anyways. Um, my friend and I, we were laughing, because, or Alex and I, um, we always used our uh, tile saw from our parents' house. When we were started getting, <laughs> it's not much, you know, it's only probably two inches that you can get, but hey, you know, we'd always take our parents' tile saws and start using it for our mineral, you know, specimens and cutting them up. It works. So that's your cheap version, right? I, okay. Jack says, yeah, 16 to 24, unless you're a major player. <laughs> yeah. So good size. As you get good at it too, it's only a two inch exposure on the blade for the little tile saws. But uh, if you get good at it, you can rotate the specimen and cut a four inch specimen in half with that. So. And we've, we've done that, and that's what we were going to say, too, is that one thing with these, especially when you're using tile saws, you want to be very careful with the cuts that you're making so a lake doesn't come to haunt you later and be in the front of your mineral specimen that's on display. So try to make the cuts in a way that removes matrix from the back but doesn't leave visible, you know, saw marks. If you do have visible saw marks, we'll talk about something next on how to actually try to get it to look natural again. But, um, but yeah, so if you... You can even do some saw marks around it. The oil saw is a little bit more difficult because you actually have to close it and let it go. But with the tile saw, you actually are able to, you know, work it with your hands. And so sometimes you'll actually, like Alex said, trim around, then break off that other side, which gives it more of a natural look of a fracture than it would just once one full sweep of a saw right through it. Also, if you're doing a decent amount of bigger stuff, you can use, you know, the towel saws that come down. To have okay. to arm the pivots rather than just the fixed blade, and that gives you tremendous control on what you can do. Yeah. So you using overarm. overarm? Are you using the, the just overarm blade? The ones that have the movable base that you can move the base up under the the um, the arm of the actual blade. Okay. Yes. Um, you get about a four inch to a five inch cut with those, but um, what the advantage to it on my book is what that kind of it. Diamond blade. Diamond blade. Um, when it's rotating, it's spitting water out. You get really wet, but it's worth it. 
Yeah, Alex. You know, the water Alex. draws a line right on the mineral, so you know exactly where the saw blade's going to go based on what that water line looks like. So it gives you a whole lot of control on making sure that you have an accurate cut. Interesting. It's not a winter activity. <laughs> no. And also, like you were talking about trimming the big pieces, you can notch them and then get the yeah. chisel in there and get them much cleaner yep. than just trying to pound, you know, you know, than trying to make your own with wedges. Especially with pegmatites. Yeah. <laughs> I see Jack says, if you have a tile saw, replace the blade with a true lapidary blade. And the factory yes. blades when I get uh, yeah, yeah, it's a real blade. I don't think we did. Yes, thank you, Jack. Yes, please, a real blade. <laughs> you know, as young kids, we were we were we were just using what we had. You know, we had to work with it. Uh, but yeah, yeah, better blades for sure. You know, doesn't ruin your parents' uh, tile saws. So maybe. Well, the <laughs> the this blade that comes with the tile saw too cuts like a two millimeter thick edge on it. So if you're yeah, doing right. small delicate stuff, those little lapidary yeah. saws are like paper, and they'll they'll slice right on through something. Mm -hmm. like that. It's real nice. So yeah, so the, the tile saws are ever and these and these tile saws are used for a lot of different. I mean, geology departments have them, labs have them. It's a very wide, very useful tool. Again, the problem becomes, even though they may be useful, they end up getting a little bit expensive, right? So you know, quality matters here. The expensive, the price, however you're comfortable. So, it, like for me and Alex, when we were young kids, it was it was the tile saw <laughs> from our parents' house. That's pretty much what we could afford, right? To just take it from our parents' uh, garage. So <laughs> that's what worked. That's what we had. Um, but yeah, they definitely come and increase in, in, in you know price. I didn't have a picture, and I I'm so mad I didn't. Andy actually has the tile saw from um, Bill Baltsley from the Moorfield Mine. So it's a large tile saw that was actually there at the Moorfield mine for a long time, which is really interesting and really cool. And he uses that. That's his tile saw. So it has some history behind it. I should have had that photograph, and I couldn't find it in my phone. Um, all right. So another thing for some people is Dremel tools. I see a lot of people that can use the Dremel tools. This is another household item that people have at their home. You can find it very easily. It's not that expensive. Um, and the... And you just buy your diamond bits, right? So you can buy different things. There's a lot of different attachments for these. So you can have a lot of different usefulness out of them. Uh, I never use Dremels much. I know that I went earlier on, I tried to use the Dremels, but again, I guess I was just really cheap as a young <laughs> when we were doing it. I didn't want to buy, buy the diamond blades, even though they weren't that expensive. Um, but again, Dremel tools are also very, very useful. But this starts getting into the next phase of these, you know, um, devices where hand-eye coordination matters a lot. So you start getting to these handheld things where you're not, you know, a large saw that sits there and it goes through to where it really matters how you're able to look at it and make sure you don't destroy the specimen. So real quick note, there was the Dremel tools. And very useful from some of the smaller stuff. So air scribe. So Alex uses this a lot, right, in the fossil. I mean, that's the big thing in fossils is using the air scribes. It's basically a tiny jackhammer in a lot of ways. Use the tungsten bits. You can use it to chip and chisel away matrix. Again, very popular in paleontology. Mineral preppers use this a lot as well. Um, it's useful for removing and exposing the specimens, but it's also useful for contouring that matrix. So if you do have saw marks and you do have specimens that have those awful looking lines, you can actually use the air scribes to, um, to uh, contour the specimen to make it look a little bit more natural. That comes with some skill, of course, because you need to actually know what, how to make it look natural or it will look a little bit odd. The problem with the air scribe is it does come with additional equipment, right? You need to have an air compressor, so you got to buy that as well. Um, again, tungsten bits, and of course, skill is very necessary in order to use this. Hand-eye coordination is very, very important. I see Kelly says, I use a Dremel press and move my specimen to have more control. Yep. Yeah, I can, I can speak to this just a little bit. Is, um, yeah, I used to use this more than anything until I switched to trilobites, and now I use hydrochloric acid. But um, one, uh, I think the biggest learning curve for this is just how much pressure you use when you're using an air scribe. So if you're trying this for the first time, um, you really don't use any pressure at all. You let the bit just oscillate on whatever you're, whatever you're going at. 
people try to push the bit into it and then you wear your bit out, you break things and you're gonna damage your specimen that way. Um, but yeah, this is, like Thomas said, it's, it requires the additional um, material. And of course, because it's specialized and only fossil nerds and other people use these things, um, everything's expensive. The little tungsten carbide bits are like $10, $15 a piece. And it's just a rod of steel that somebody sharpened, that, you know, so, but it, it, I mean, high demand because it, it is a great tool. I will add, at least from my perspective, I, I own one of these and I have to have a good justification for myself for when I'm using it because holding it for any ex extended period of time, uh, I have to think about nerve damage um, from the constant vibration and wearing a glove doesn't really help that. Well, yeah, Alex, <laughs> Alex, well, you do that, yeah. I was going to, yeah, I, I, um, I never got any uh, problems using the tool, but I, I always use the little tiny ones, the little delicate ones. Um, but I did give myself nerve damage with the geology hammer, so that's another story. And then moving over to more of like the sand blasters and air abrasion. Um, this is where, you know, it's also very useful for certain things. You see a lot of professionals, you know, out and they use these. I will say, though, that for what they're used for, sometimes the textile cleaning guns can get some of that surface material off without having to use like an air, or, you know, a sandblaster or something. Um, just like before, uh, it is another skill-based device. So skill matters here, hand-eye coordination matters. It's not only that you're going to need the air compressor, the actual uh, abrasion set or the sandblaster itself, but you're also going to need some sort of box to actually do this in for safety purposes. Now you can make those, right? So people make a lot of them themselves. They actually just use wood and hey, I see they, they say they made theirs. So you, you can either buy them, you can make them. So a lot of people can do it yourself type of thing, but there is a lot of cost that comes with that. Um, of course, it's important here to be very knowledgeable about the hardness of the material that you're working with right? You don't want to use any abrasives that are going to damage or etch away that specimen. But it's also important to note that even if your specimen, let's say, has a hardness of seven, and you want to maybe say, oh, let me just use something the hardness of six, you, maybe not, right? There can be some softer things that can still damage your specimens. So you want to be very clear on what you're using and how you're using it. I see that Kelly, I think, um, mentioned uh, wearing hearing protection with this because it can get loud. So yes, that's another, especially with the air compressor as well. Um, different types of abrasives people use, walnut, glass beads, aluminum oxide, uh, baking soda in some cases, garnet, crushed garnet, of course, polygrit. So there's a lot of different things that people use depending on the situation, right? And that comes back down to what we said earlier. Know the location, know the specimens, know what you're working with. Yeah, and I can, just to drive that point home, softer can break harder. Um, hardness is, is a, a material is resistant to abrasion, it's scratching. So um, I, I meant to mention this when we were talking about the, the hammers and tools like that. Um, a lot of flint nappers use bone tools and I've, you can even use wood tools to nap flint. And obviously uh, chert is a lot harder than wood. That's something that people tend not to not to realize. If you're using tools in the field to clean minerals, just because it's plastic, just because it's wood, doesn't mean you can't break the tip off of a quartz cluster or something like that. And the same principle applies here. Um, a lot of people, when they're first starting with this kind of thing, they think, oh, it, whatever I'm trying to remove, I need to use an abrasive that's harder than it, so it removes it. And uh, no, the opposite is true. You want to use something that's not only softer, but usually a lot softer because it's not the hardness that really does the work. It's, it's just the constant bombardment of the, of the abrasive. And you want to be, the, the trick is always, I want to remove one material, but I want to preserve some other material. So you have to hit that sweet spot. I see the Andy made a comment talking about silica dust causing lung damage. Yeah, that's, you definitely want to have the safety equipment to be doing this as well. So 
I see that there's like, you know, the vacuum system there. There's all these different devices that you need to have to be very, very careful when using this. So that's a great comment, the safety side of it for sure. One of Bryce said that you guys didn't talk about, and it's kind of socially not a good thing these days, but it works super well, is plastic bead. Mm -hmm. um, but again, same kind of thing. You've got to be very careful with these. You can burn a hole in your hand faster than anything. Um, and the um, units are very loud. Yeah, yeah. well, yeah, I think the, the way that we try to go about this, especially with this presentation, is that these start getting more progressively more complex, right? <laughs> so there's definitely a learning curve. There's definitely utilize your local people who have done this, who know this, people that you meet tonight, if you're interested in learning more, you know, that's, that's why we're here. So, you know, definitely need to be very safe with a lot of these things. A very good comment. Yes, for sure. Well, something I've found on the sandblasting is sometimes you might start out with a softer abrasive yep. and see what that does to clean the mineral and then maybe step it up a little bit if you need to. Yeah. That way you don't destroy things. I don't think, I don't think I mentioned it, but I, I do know that like when we talked a little bit about, you know, prepping and cleaning these specimens, you can almost over prep and over clean. So just like the water guns, just like everything probably in this entire presentation, it's always good to step back a little bit on things and then move forward versus start where it may make sense and then ruin something, right? Because again, that's the worst feeling when you ruin something. So like you said, it's a great comment, Gary. You know, step back a little bit, try something first, then go forward with it. Gradually increase that. That's a common problem with our trilobites is over preparation. A lot of our calcified trilobites are prepared using air abrasion units and they're like, oh, beautiful, smooth trilobite. And it's, well, no, the species actually has sculpture, but you done sandblasted the whole thing smooth. So the same can apply to minerals. Uh, as an addendum to that, I would say, if you start getting carried away or you start having nagging doubts, stop, take a break, move on to a different piece, come back to it. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> yeah, or if the box starts clouding up, maybe take a break. Yeah, what, one other thing, even on the uh, sandblasting, just make sure all the seals are extremely tight and well sealed when you're using some, some of the boxes and stuff. Yeah, and don't blast through your gloves. Yeah. That's the problem, people's gloves start getting worn and they don't want to spend the money on the gloves, but that's the only thing keeping your skin attached to your body. So yeah, the gloves are, and the seal around the gloves is one, is, is one of your most important places on, on this equipment. All right, and then the last thing as far as the mechanical methods is your diamond tip blades, right? So this starts get when you get to the big boy realm as far as your diamond, you know, diamond coated chainsaw blades and your angle grinders and maybe your, even your drills, right? Using drills out in the field to help, you know, possibly create fractures or at least give you places to chisel in and open it up. I think we had a previous picture um, here I didn't talk a little bit about, but you have these wedges and then you have the feathers there or the, sh the shims that you can actually help split. So you see that a lot. So maybe having these diamond tipped uh, blades or drills to actually um, help you with cutting that rock. Now, you can probably tell here this comes with a price tag as well or it starts getting a little bit more expensive. Um, the angle grinders and these other saws that are battery powered, I see this a lot out in the field. People bring these out if you have the space to carry them up a mountain or you have your vehicle nearby, very, very useful to bring out to the field and get those diamond blades to use them out there. So another great tool um, to, to be able to use out the field. Um, but again, it, it comes with prices. You know, these things are a little bit more for people that are using it for the larger scale things. And, you know, safety, of course. <laughs> you look at the thing over there, there's probably, you already can tell there, there's a safety feature behind this as well. All right, so let's get to the chemicals. And I know this is where everyone's really interested in talking about. Now I, I put everything warning, warning here, right? Because I think it's important just to highlight that it's very important to practice safety with chemicals, even if they're chemicals that you're very confident with and you've used before, 
for any new beginner or anyone that's looking in here, please go over and make sure you read instructions, read the safety, read as much as you can before using these types of uh, these chemical methods. Uh, again, important tips here. <clears throat> uh, never use acids <clears throat> without the proper safety equipment, right? Again, we've been talking about that safety equipment, safety equipment, right? <laughs> Casper says, don't lose your fingerprints unless you want to. Maybe you There's have reason that you want to yeah, remove your fingerprints. Maybe you're criminal. I'm not giving any ideas here. Um, but <laughs> yeah, don't intentionally or maybe don't unintentionally remove your fingertips. Um, so gloves are very important. We always use these big, thick green gloves when we were doing uh, different types of acids. Always have the proper venting or have open space to prevent inhalation of the fumes. You, that's a big, big thing, right? Don't get it on your skin. Don't breathe it in. Two big key things here. Make sure you know which acid to use, when to use it, and always mix. Not only does it make it more effective, but you don't you want to be very knowledgeable what you're using on the pieces. Take advantage of Mendat, as I said before, especially if you're looking at localities and you have a piece from somewhere and you want to do prep work on it and it's a popular place, then there's probably someone who's suffered the same situation you have and has already worked to figure out the best method to actually prep from that location. Um, so check out the messaging boards, check out your local clubs, Get engaged with that because that's going to be a great way to actually figure out some of these best, best methods. Uh, and then, of course, some minerals react to specific acids. So make sure you know what you want to keep and what you want to remove. Don't, don't use something that's going to remove something you want, right? So we'll talk about that, but that's just something that, of course, is very important. Is anyone besides Casper with Don't Lose Your Fingerprints uh, have any like very key safety things that you think are very important when you work with acids? Well, uh, I want to add that um, the way I think about it, and nobody likes to hear about safety stuff, I understand, but the, the way I think about it is with the mechanical tools, the mechanical prep approaches, the consequences of being unsafe are immediate and obvious. With chemicals, they can be subtle and long-term and you know something could be happening to your lungs that you don't notice while you're working with these materials. So I think that's mainly the reason to be cautious. It's nothing mysterious about chemicals that makes them any different from tools really. It's just the subtler effect that they may have on you. And obviously if you burn yourself with acid, you, you're aware of it. But a lot of the times it's the, it's the fumes, it's the things you don't know of. You wake up the next morning and you got a little bit of a cough and you, know, you don't notice that in real time. Exactly, that's a good point. So let's start with our first and probably the most popular and most well known and used is your oxalic acid. Oh, I'm sorry, and, one other, one yes. other thing. Please, please. Um, especially when you work with the more serious acids, which we'll get to, you want a bucket of base sitting there. So if you do have the accident, it. something to neutralize it with. So when you're working with acids, so normally if it's the heavy duty ones, we always had a big bucket of base sitting there ready to use. And especially for like hydrofluoric and things like that, we would actually put a lower bucket with the base neutralizer in it, put the bucket of the acid above it. So if it cracked or anything, it would be immediately neutralized and not uh, become a danger. Yeah, double contained thing. Having something to neutralize the acid if you spill something or whatever is, is, a, is a, a, and not just a little box of, you know, baking soda. So. That's a good point. That's a really good point. So the first acid is going to be oxalic acid. And of course, this is your, you know, common one. And in a lot of ways, let's be honest, this is the one that may serve a lot of purpose, right? It may be pretty much what you need for a lot of things. I know that the biggest complaint for a lot of specimens is, God, it's got that damn iron oxide on it. So for most purposes, most people, when they do delve into acids, will only ever really need to focus on oxalic acid, right? That's pretty much the one that serves a lot of people's purpose. Uh, first timers and people who are getting into it um, normally go into the iron out. I don't use iron out. I normally go for more of the pure form oxalic acid and then mix that, of course, with water. But um, iron out is something that you can get at your local stores. It's oxalic acid, but it has other things in it, like other fragrances and citric acid. So it's not as strong as 
what we would probably end up using and would be effective, especially for time purposes. Um, you see here that this is what oxalic acid looks like in its pure form, it's white, and it can be bought pretty fairly, I mean, easy. I mean, there's places that sell it online from different laboratories sell it. You also can get it from different rock shops. I think I bought it from one down in South Carolina. It shipped to me and it wasn't that expensive and it lasted for a long time. You can get pretty big bags of this as well, um, but very, very useful. Uh, the iron staining again uh, is gonna be that main issue for a lot of people. Phosphoric acid can also be used, but again, almost serves the same purpose. I think phosphoric is a little bit harder to find. It's a little bit more ex expensive. So I wouldn't even say phosphoric acid, just go with your oxalic acid. Um, oh, the thing think. about oxalic acid, if you have, um, a lot of people like to put them in, um, uh, what do you call them, slow cookers. Um, if you do that, you've got to keep in mind that oxalic is going to re react with the metal in the slow cooker. So you have to make sure that you have an older one that has the uh, ceramic liner. Yeah. Um, and don't ever use it again. Um, <laughs> oh, no, you can use it for that, just not to cook. Yeah, don't use yeah. it to cook. Well, we, we'll definitely talk about the, we, we got the next slide, we're going to talk about the crock pot method. <laughs> um, but again, it's, it's not a bad thing. So again, like Alex said, just got to be very careful, be safe with it. I, it's something that's very, very common as an issue and something we use a lot. Also, again, with all these acids, wash, wash, wash it off. Once you're done with it, clean it. We always say also put it in a pot of distilled water, boil it and keep it in that. That way it gets all of the acids out. It could crystallize, it could leave yellow gross films on it, make it look disgusting. So after you put it in an acid, you also need to make sure you clean it with water and that also neutralizes it. So just clean it, clean it, clean it with water. Um, and if you're unfamiliar, by the way, oxalic acid is very, very weak in, in, as far as acids go. And so um, it's one of the safer options. It's a bit counterintuitive. It eats iron oxide, which is a fairly chemically stable compound, um, but it's a pretty weak acid in its food grade. And so it's cheap. Um, so we'll get to it in the next slide, but yeah, oftentimes it's so weak that it will eat the iron oxide, but only if you heat it up. And so you have to put it on heat in a crock pot. And, uh, and I'll probably re reiterate the point if you don't, Thomas, on the next slide that you need to get every last drop of acid out of the specimen before you dry it out and put it in your display case. That's important. This is just two pictures. This is your common thing that everyone thinks about when they talk about iron oxides is the crystals from Arkansas tend to be the key, the key player in that game or as an easy example that people who are starting to get into mineral collecting will first notice. You see, you got the orange and, and that's another thing on our Facebook groups on Virginia minerals and stuff. People always comment, what is this? And it ends up being iron oxides a lot of the time. What is this red coloration? What is this orange coloration? It's very common. So Having oxalic acid and learning to use it is very beneficial if you're going to be collecting minerals. So here are two different specimens, but you can see um, what it does and the purpose that it serves. You can also ask yourself a question sometimes, do I even want to remove the iron oxide? Sometimes that adds some sort of unique characteristic to it. So some people will keep that orange color because it doesn't look so gross. So that's another question you can ask yourself, do I even want to remove it? Um, necessarily. And then of course the crock pot method, right? So we use the old crock pots. That's what we use. That's one of our crock pots. Um, don't ever use it for food. <laughs> food again, that's a big no-no. Don't think you can clean it out. Use it for food. Definitely not a good thing. Be very careful how it reacts to the metals and stuff, but we use um, the old crock pots and definitely keep them separated. Um, it is vital here, of course, ventilation, key, 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 ventilation. Um, we do it outside a lot of the times. We're doing it in a place that has good ventilation. When you open it up, open it up away from your face, even if you have good ventilation, and let the fumes come out. If you open it up and look in and say, oh, let me see my crystals, <laughs> you're going to get a face full of, uh, of fumes, and you're going to be coughing up some mess after that. Don't do that. Oxalic acids vary. Even though it is a weak acid, if you get it on your skin, it will definitely burn. And it will definitely not feel great, so it will hurt. So don't do that. Don't don't stick your hand in there with open cuts or anything like that. So definitely not a good thing to do. Um, here is an example that we want to show from Bedford County, Virginia. This is a garnet. It's showing you that really gross oxidized 
um, quartz. The problem is, though, is that we learned from the lesser quality specimens that if we put them in the oxalic acid, they turn cherry red and look awful. So this gets into some of the sketchy things that people may not like, but we took it off the matrix. We actually were able to clean it with an eraser that actually worked to clean the garnet, and then we cleaned the matrix and then repaired it and put it back. This is in our collection, so we were okay with doing that ourselves. Uh, and then this is what you see afterwards. So that's the same piece. So you can see from, it's on the back side though, but you can see that uh, that's the back of it, but this is the same specimen. So you can see how clear and white it's made the quartz. It didn't react with the mica. We took the, the garnet off, put it back on, used an eraser to clean it up a lot more and that worked really well. The damage on the top of it is um, coming from uh, the, uh, pocket itself because it was up to feldspar and a lot of the times when these garnets were forming the feldspar they just broke up a lot so it didn't work really well yeah uh, so thomas says that the the garnets turn cherry red in the acid that might sound like a good thing but just trust us that they're they're full of cracks so the garnets got a kind of nice brownish red color but the cracks are gross and white and bleached and so when you take all of that black oxide that's filling those cracks out of there it just ends up looking like a mess and it also kind of blends into the matrix a little bit it doesn't have that contrast um, but another thing that i've been using thomas that i have here um, it's not a crock pot but it's like one of those little um i don't know what you call it but it you put wax in it and it heats up wax and and it's like a candle without a flame i suppose just a mini crock pot and that works great too. put oxalic in that put little specimens in there and the thing about oxalic, I didn't put it in the last slide, and I mentioned it a little bit, but the reason that we do the crock pots, it speeds up that process. I mean, you could sit stuff in oxalic acid, and it could sit there for two or three weeks to really work well, depending on how you know much iron is in that. But using a crock pot can speed it up to a day or two days, depending on how heavily stained your specimens are. I know the stuff out from Colorado takes a long time, doesn't it? It takes a long time to get out the, the iron oxide. It's almost just pure red. It's got a thick, thick layer of that on it. Yeah, and our workflow too was to put these things in acid and then we actually boiled this, the specimens in distilled water afterwards to make sure you get all the little acid out because what that'll do is, you know, these, it's quartz, sure, but it is porous, it has cracks, it has void space in it. And so it'll absorb acid. If you don't get that out, it'll crystallize when the specimen dries and it will, um, the best case scenario is it'll crystallize on the surface and look gross. Worst case scenario is it'll actually push the specimen apart and, and help to disintegrate it. So we always would boil. It, it, anything you put in the crock pot is going to presumably be temperature resistant as long as you don't thermal shock it. Take it out, let it cool down, take it out, and then boil it in water afterwards. And usually we did a couple of different rinses of water if we were doing a lot of specimens at once just to make sure all the acid came out. Hold on one second. All right, let me. Uh, so the next acid is acetic acid. And I'm going to let Alex talk about this because this is one of his specimens that he has used before or that he, had, he prepped out. This is a fossil, I know, but bear with us. Yeah, so a lot of the stuff that applies to fossils is at least analogous to minerals. Um, I will say using acetic acid for minerals. Um, I've only ever done it out of convenience. If I don't have anything else lying around, you can go to the store and get, you know, 3% acetic um, distilled vinegar. But we, the reason we used it for fossils is because the fossil is chemically similar to the matrix. The matrix is calcium carbonate, the fossil is calcium phosphate. And the only way to prepare it is with a buffered solution of acetic acid. If you use anything else, you, you, you gobble up the fossil. I don't know if that's ever going to be an issue with mineral specimens, unless you're like trying to get an apatite crystal out of a piece of calcite. Um, but like I said, it does the same thing that hydrochloric does. It's just much weaker and much slower. So if you want a controlled version of hydrochloric, which we'll get to, um, this acid works, works pretty well for that. And then uh, hydrochloric acid, right? Or muriatic or muriatic acid. Um, and this is basically for moving calcite. It's been a, is a good key way of, of how most people end up intend, intending to use it. 
A lot of geology labs have this for testing whether or not they'll always use it in the physical geology classrooms to see if it's, you know, limestone or quartz when you're telling, you know, teaching people the, their rocks and their minerals. So hydrochloric acid is something that we use a lot. This is actually a specimen um, from uh, Eagle Rock, Virginia, and it's north of Ceres as a fossil again, but um, we use it to remove a lot of the calcite uh, on the pyrites from these that have, or the calcite in the pyrite in these fossils, there's a little bit of both. So we actually use it to remove the calcite, shine up the specimen, but at the same time, it almost will give a karst-like appearance or almost etch away the shale a little bit, because that has calcite in it as well, and make it look a little bit glossy. But we will use hydrochloric acid sometimes as well. You can get uh, from the store, but you can also get more pure versions of it. Again, this is something nasty as well. You don't want to use this because it could have some safety issues as well. Yes, yeah, so this is one of the strong acids. Um, it doesn't usually say on the label, but just FYI, the stuff you get at the hardware store is 30 to 35% concentration. And that is pretty much the max concentration as far as how uh, reactive, how effective the acid is. You need that water component in there to provide extra hydrogen to, to complete reactions. Um, and so it, 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 the more concentrated an acid is, it doesn't mean it gets more, more reactive. If you tried to use 100% hydrochloric on, on something, it actually won't dissolve it um, past a certain point. And so, um, but the advantage of getting pure acid is it's, it goes a lot longer. You add water to it and you can stretch it out. One gallon of 30% muriatic, it's, you know, I don't know how much, a few hundred milliliters of actual acid and the rest is water. So something to be aware of. Let's see. If the specimen doesn't clean after the first treatment with acid, is it better to repeat using the same acid or is it okay or safe to use a stronger acid the second time? Of course, rinsing in between. Um, it depends on why it's not working. Yeah. So um, it's either not working because it's self buffering or it's too weak, in which case you can try heating it. Usually when you add a little external energy to the system, it gets a little bit more reactive like the oxalic acid. If you put something that you know has iron oxide on it in the oxalic and it just won't eat it, sometimes it won't and you just need to boil it, heat it up in a crock pot or, or over a um, hot plate, something like that. Um, and then only when you're certain that it's not because of the chemistry, it's, or it's not because of the, the physical properties, it's because of the chemistry, then you can try to try a different acid, not necessarily a stronger acid, just a different acid. It's all about the chemistry of the specimen that you're dealing with. So Mike says, should, should we dilute a 30% acid to a lower percent? Uh, you can. Um, if, you're, if you've got a specimen and it's like, I've got a silicate mineral inside calcite and I wanna get rid of the calcite and just have the silicate mineral, you dunk it in 30% and it'll gobble up the matrix and you'll, it'll go very quickly. So for my trilobites, for example, our trilobite specimens are, are silicified secondarily, they're, they're made of quartz, but their matrix is limestone and we don't care about the matrix. So we just dunk them in about 10% acid solution because we make it ourselves and it, uh, it, it, it eats up the matrix and then all you're left with are the residues. Um, there are cases where the chemistry is not as straightforward. You're not, maybe you're not certain whether the matrix is all that different from the mineral or from the fossil, in which case you'll want to start with a dilute, a, a more dilute version. Um, but honestly, in my experience, anything less than about 10% concentration, it's just not very effective for, for HCL. It becomes so diluted that, I mean, you might as well use vinegar. It, it has the same basic properties at that point. Yeah. But yeah, you can stretch. You, so you buy a gallon of this 30%. You can stretch that by diluting it because it'll work pretty all the way down to about 10%. So, I don't like doing the math on it, so I usually just use the 30%. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to apologize. We're not going to talk about hydrofluoric <laughs> because, you know, that's something that I don't really want to engage in, uh, especially with, you know, the fact that it's so, so super, super, super 
not safe. Uh, professionals only, uh, definitely you could work with people who you know or people that you meet and the clubs and stuff that do use it. I know that some members definitely do have the equipment and do have the necessary tools and expertise to use it. Um, two things that it is very useful for is, well, mainly it's useful for removing cords. Uh, which is <laughs> when you're removing cords, you got something pretty toxic. You got something pretty crazy. Um, so a lot of times you'll see it in removing cords from gold specimens. You see a lot of those really beautiful leaflets of gold and gold crystals. They've been treated with hydrofluoric acid to actually remove the quartz. Uh, and other times you'll see it famously with uh, clinging quartz off of fluorite uh, is something also very common. So uh, definitely, definitely, definitely something that is useful, but is, we've been collecting for a long time and haven't had a purpose for it. So, you know, that's something that I would definitely refer to someone who would be your local expert or a friend or a professional. If you have something that's so high quality that you do know that the value would increase by using hydrofluoric. If it's something that's not so necessary, then I wouldn't recommend even thinking more about it. Yeah, get an expert on that one because I mean, there's so many things that can go wrong with that that will be fatal, period. Yeah. Um, the other thing that's really good for cleaning, unfortunately, is tourmaline. That's most tourmaline specimens are in some way treated with hydrofluoric, but get somebody else to do it. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, so we wanted to bring it up because, you know, it's there, it exists, it's a reality of the mineral community. There's lots of discussions on MINDAP, but again, you, I, I, I know that there are people at multiple places in the state that have the experience and have the capability and have those things to do it. So there is a community, there are people on MINDAP, you can find more information, but again, I would not recommend that, especially for people watching this afterwards, who didn't watch it tonight and hear that. Um, yeah, so be very careful. a couple of notes, just to drive the point home, hydrofluoric is both acidic and toxic poisonous. So it's dangerous, not really because it's a particularly strong acid. It doesn't actually really dissolve flesh all that well, but it's toxic. And um, I personally only know of two chemicals that will eat glass, and that's hydrofluoric and boiling sodium hydroxide. So if it eats the thing that you normally do your chemistry in, it's probably <laughs> to the professionals. And this is, we were, we were joking about it. One thing that you could hit the point home further, this is the uh, acid used on Breaking Bad for yeah. dissolving the body. It doesn't really do that. But again, I think the point is that it just kind of serves a purpose to like highlight as a joke how serious this acid is. It wouldn't actually do that. But it just goes to show you this is something you just don't mess with. Um, the biggest problem with it is it will eat bone. It'll, yeah. yes. it'll actually absorb through your skin and then it will start chewing away at the bone and it kills the nerves on the way in. So you don't know that you've got a problem with it until it's almost too late. Yeah. It acts on a cellular level. Yeah. Yeah, Jack put some good comments down there in the chat uh, for those of you that are watching that as well that could talk a little bit more about the specifics of the hydrofluoric itself. But we're going to move on from there because we're going to finish with adhesives, epoxies, the repair, the, the other things. And this is where it gets into uh, personal preference, right? Do you want to repair your mineral specimens? Do you want to, you know, reconstruct them? Do you, do you feel confident in that? Is that something you want to do? Some people don't. Uh, I put a little joking image here because <laughs> this is something that takes a little bit of expertise. If you don't glue it properly, you may be stuck and it may look a little bit off. So, be very careful with this. So we'll finish with this. So the two things, um, first is stabilization and consolidation. And this comes back to some paleo terms as well, but we would consider stabilization being a situation where that mineral may chemically decay over time and it requires methods to stop that process. And consolidation would just be very similar, but instead of chemically unstable, it's physically unstable. It may disintegrate over time. And we'll have some examples as well. Um, the three different things that we'll bring up, there's a lot of different stuff in the community people talk about. Elmer glue and water is that basic version. Uh, PVA or polyvinyl acetate beads, putting it in acetone. And then butt VAR 76 or just B76, probably the more 
with uh, acetone. But I'll let Alex talk a little bit more about this since he comes from that paleo side and can speak more on it. Yeah, so we're switching from inorganic chemistry to organic chemistry here. So I'll take a stab at this. Um, this is where, in my opinion, things get gray and very complicated, um, but I don't think it has to be. Um, like Thomas said, stabilization is when something is chemically reactive and you need to coat it in something or get it to the point where it's stable in normal earth atmospheric conditions. We live on a very um, oxidizing planet and so most minerals don't like being in a display case filled with oxygen. Um, but also photosensitive, so minerals that, that uh, fade or decay with light um, can be protected with some of these, some of these things. Um, and then if something is physically brittle, we, you know, we talked about using the um, sonic cleaners. It's not good for, for um, brittle specimens. Well, consolidants are often used for, for that, at least in paleontology. Um, these examples are some of the more common ones, but they also have an advantage in that they're reversible. So these are all, um, I forget the name, there, there's a word for it, but these are all materials that uh, are added to a solvent and then the solvent evaporates and leaves the material behind and that's how they, they operate. And so Elmer's glue is great if you want a water soluble consolidant um, or I don't know how well it works as a stabilizing agent. Um, I personally don't prefer Elmer's glue because the other thing that we have abundance of on earth is water and so using a water soluble material doesn't make as much sense to me but some people swear by it particularly the Green River fossil people they love using their their Elmer's glue diluted in water so you don't just squirt glue over the specimen you dilute it in <laughs> one or two parts water something like that yeah he's a one part one part and then some people say one part two part of but the main the main point is you want it not to be waxy or actually have a noticeable layer right in all these cases you yeah. want to find a solution that actually does serves the purpose but doesn't make it visually noticeable and, right? and licks into the specimen and soaks into the specimen um so the uh the pva and in, in the paraloid boot var 76 um these are pretty much the same thing they're just plastics except the solvent is acetone instead of water. Um, so there, you'll get a, well, if you do it properly, you'll get a watertight seal on, on whatever specimen you're working with as well, which is, in, in my opinion, it works almost exactly the same as the Elmer's glue. It's just a different solvent and it, and it has better properties in the end, but everybody has their, their view on that. All right, we're gonna move on because I never got time here. Uh, yes. one, one, one issue, of course, is pyrite, right? You always see that a lot, especially with the pyrite sons from Illinois or pyrite fossil specimens. Some people call it pyrite decay, pyrite rot, just the, the overall issue of pyrite decaying over time. So many people will have collections where they'll come back, seen it plenty of times, uh, years later, and their pyrite sun is completely disintegrated. So you can see the specimen over the left, it's probably been one, repaired, they've probably taken that off and put it back on after cleaning it. Two, you can also see that it has some kind of gloss, not very noticeable, but you can see a sheen to it. So it has been preserved to prevent any further deterioration. But then of course, this is a fossil to the right that has been in the unfortunate situation of decaying and then completely ruining. So a natural process, but one that you need to be very cognizant of. And in Virginia, we have the Vivianite locality, which we can't collect at any longer, but we have specimens out there on the market or out there in collections. And the way that they grew in the clay, over time, the clay would dry, crack, and because the Vivianite basically just grew inside the clay and expanded, as it dries, it just falls apart. So, so many collections years later would find their Vivianites that had fallen apart. I've heard Elmer's glue, the water thing, have been used on these a lot. Uh, some people have sprayed them, and that's probably not the best thing to do. Uh, the one on the left is a beautiful specimen from the Laura Robbins Gallery, about the size of a, of a softball, and oh, no, I'm sorry, the size of a volleyball. And um, it just, you can see that there's some sort of coating, but again, it doesn't, it doesn't hurt it at all and make it look unnatural. But again, we must specify here, some of these steps besides, this is probably, as far as some people are willing to go. When we start talking about repairing, you know, 
reconstructing, people may not want to do that, but stabilizing and consolidating, very, very important. So repair, um, that's basically a very simple process, putting pieces back together that have either become separated naturally, or I always joke, human error. <laughs> How many times have we dropped a specimen? I know I've done it. <laughs> the very, very awful feeling of dropping a specimen and, and then asking yourself, holy hell, how am I gonna put this back? Uh, so, you know, it becomes very important for a lot of people, but some people don't, either don't want to repair specimens or once it's repaired, it's, it's good etiquette in the mineral community. You need to let people know it's been prepared. So you want to be very clear. Some people will try to hide that and that's not okay, but it may be okay to repair that specimen as long as you make sure it's been, you tell people it's been repaired or you're okay with it being repaired. Um, and of course, it's a cyanoacrylate or super glue. I use Loctite, we've used Loctite, but you can use, you know, Gorilla Glue and other brands work as well. Um, the ultra liquid control is something that we really like. You gotta be very careful here though that you don't get glues that may over time get yellow or get ugly or you know create this weird discoloration. So be very careful. Some key tips here, find the best fit before you glue. You get one shot. Do not put the glue and then figure out how the heck I'm gonna put this thing back together. Put it back together, figure out the best fit. Within that same process, you may wanna clean out the inside of that specimen. Maybe there's calcite that's formed in there if it's been naturally separated that's coated in or maybe there's an oxide layer. Maybe you need to clean out the clay in it. If it's clean, then maybe it will fit to back together a lot nicer. So clean that out, do your other prep work first and then actually put it back. Um, if it's a lot, you know, on the heavier side of things, we've used epoxy or different things to do that as well because it's a lot heavier. Um, he says, could you repeat what's best for pirate and marcasite? How badly tarnish native copper cleaning and then preventing future tarnish? Oh, yeah, I can comment on that. Yeah. Um, so if, if you're asking what material is best for marcasite and pyrite, um, I would use one of the acetone soluble consolidants, so PVA or B76 for those, because if you dilute it down quite a bit with the acetone, um, and you soak the specimen, it'll soak into the specimen, it'll coat it, but it won't be noticeable once it dries. Um, and it should protect it um, from further degradation. The Vivianite specimens, you could probably also do that with. I, I, don't, I don't know much about the Vivianite, but um, I would be hesitant to use the um, Elmer's glue on that because if it's clay, um, moisture tends to expand and contrast clay. And so I wouldn't want to use something with water, but who knows what, what if it works, it works. Um, I forgot to mention for the native copper actually is a good point. Hydrochloric acid dissolves copper oxides and copper compounds, but doesn't really react too well with copper itself. So if you have a tarnished native copper specimen, putting that in hydrochloric acid can actually shine it up without really damaging it too much as opposed to acetic acid, which will dissolve the copper and give it sort of a matte finish. Um, and then protecting it over time, again, I would go to the, to the acetone soluble consolidants. That, that, would, that would be my go-to for anything like that. Good question, Mike, that's a good question. Now, we, we didn't talk about it too, but we could. I mean, the, the opals and, and like the hay, you know, salt and different types of minerals like that, like the halides and stuff, you may want to use mineral oil or other things on that to try to, prevent some, I mean, maybe not mineral oil, but you can use other things to try to prevent the water and the moisture from ruining those specimens. And you said, what do you normally use on your opals, Alex? Well, um, some of the opals are hopeless, but uh, like the ones from Nevada, they, they put them, as far as I understand, they put them in mineral oil or glycerin is commonly used, um, or just water. Um, people, I guess, have their preferences. The, for the opals in Nevada, they usually put them in a clear jar, fill it with that liquid. And so they want a liquid that's got a, a refractive index that's different enough from the opal that it shows off its optical properties. So that's where that preference of, is it oil, water, glycerin, whatever you use, it's really just how, how um, thick the liquid is, I suppose. Um, but yeah, for salt, halite, or, or um, other kinds of 
um, you know, moisture sensitive minerals, you can use oils or glycerins. Um, it's maintenance though, because you constantly have to replace it. You constantly have to be uh, scrubbing it back up with oil every few months or so. All right, and so here is an example that we were showing earlier. These are the garnets. So this is showing several different things going on here. The first thing on the left or the first picture is the original specimen. So as we're getting this out, you start seeing that the garnets kind of fall off of it. We're also removing the garnets because we know that if we put in oxalic acid, it will ruin it. Um, we're doing some repair here. We're not doing any reconstruction, but we are repairing it. We're cleaning it. We're doing all the different techniques that we talked about before to get to the final product. And you can see there from that first step to the last step, putting everything back together. Again, the problem with this location is the garnets have dinged edges or kind of weird faces because the way that they grew into the feldspar, it almost messed them up and ruined them in a lot of ways. But you can see how we did that. We put it all back together to get to that final specimen using what we talked about. Yeah, and this is a good example too, because I, I notice now there's a piece of garnet in that middle picture in the upper middle. Yeah, right there. That's what it looks like when it goes in the acid. That's a piece that, that stayed on when we put it in the acid and it just looks gross. So. And you can see we put it back over, so that tries to prevent it there. But again, these are, these are decisions you have to make, right? This is the decision you have to make. Do you want to do this? Do you not want to do this? What's the best method? For us, we were okay with it. This was something we were going to keep and not try to sell or anything. So we and were we okay. experimented ahead of time. Yeah. Um, we, we definitely would love to do this one. This is actually the same locality, but it's at the Virginia Tech Geology Museum. And of course, they won't let me do <laughs> They They won't let us clean or prep it. But just imagine what that would look like if it was. Uh, this is actually the size of a, a little bit smaller than a tennis ball. Massive garnet from that locality, but you can see all the iron oxide staining and everything and use it, even using the eraser, we can't even do that, but using the eraser to actually clean up the faces a lot on this specimen, but just to go you show you what it would look like without. Um, and then here's the fossil that we showed earlier. So here's the first phase of getting it out of the limestone, bringing it here, and then this is that tedious process of a paleontologist to piece back together and to repair which goes back to the bring home the pocket, keep all the pieces. Uh, this is super, super small, and Alex put this back together, which is freaking incredible uh, to be able to do that on the, under the microscope. So you can see that whole process of what we've been talking about. Yeah, so uh, I can comment on that one just real quick, Thomas. Um, you're talking about keeping the pieces as that was, so this specimen was fractured in, in the matrix, so it was coming out in pieces. And so I had to sift the residues every, every time I changed the acid, I sift the residues, found little bits of this jaw and kept those and then put it back together at the end. The whole thing took about three months of dissolving it in acid and putting it back together under the microscope. And we used um, super glue mostly to put the pieces back together. You can see that main fang there is, we had, uh, didn't get every little piece. There's a little gap in the middle of it there. Um, but that was under the microscope using super glue. Um, one thing I meant to mention is that super glue does not dry with air. It reacts with water. It reacts with moisture, and that's what cures it. So when you blow on it, it's the moisture in your breath that causes it to solidify, not the, not the wind, as it were. Um, and then that specimen is coated in a consolidant. That's why it's kind of shiny. Uh, I went a little heavy on the consolidant. I've actually gone back and... and um, put a little bit of acetone on there to get rid of some of that gloss since this picture was taken. All right, so then I'll, I'll let you finish off with the reconstruction and then I'll just finish up with the post cleaning, but this is your territory and I don't normally delve into this. And again, disclaimer, one, it's a lot of experimental stuff going on here. <laughs> it can be very risky and a lot of people don't like necessarily doing this, but this is a case where you're putting you have missing space or missing parts of the crystal and you're replacing it with four material. You see this a lot in paleontology where you have missing parts, but you're recreating that and you're putting it into play. Yeah, so um, this gets into ethical territories with mineral specimens because people, like Thomas said, people don't like fake specimens. Um, I, 
I only ever employ this when a specimen is missing a piece and needs the structural help of some bit of putty or um, acrylic in between there. And, uh, or like if a crystal in a cluster has got its tip dinged, I'll reconstruct the tip. But I do so with materials that are noticeably different from the specimen. And so one thing that I've been experimenting with and I haven't really come to any good workflow yet is um, acrylics or epoxies that are clear when they harden and or you can even add pigments to them. So they look perfectly normal under normal light but they're fluorescent. So if you want to know which, which parts are fake and which parts aren't, you put a black light on it and uh, it shows up. They don't really do this for fossils too much because very rarely do you care about the aesthetic quality of a fossil. Um, you care about the scientific information that the fossil has. So you want to use a material that's actually got a high contrast to the look of the fossil. So it's obvious what's fake and what's not. And um, so you can see that there with those hominid skulls. The putty or plaster or clay that they use to reconstruct the skulls is, um, in the old days, they used to try to paint it to match the skulls because they were all about, you know, look at this missing link I found. But nowadays they use oftentimes pigmented or, or very high contrast materials just to make sure that it's clear what's real and what's not because you don't want to base your scientific publication off of a fake um, fossil. And I think the same sort of lesson can be applied to minerals. Yeah, I, I, the UV light and stuff, that's also very helpful to bring around with you at Tucson. <laughs> if you ever go to some of these big shows, bring you a little UV light uh, just to bring around a little flashlight because boy, this starts getting into, like Alex said, those territory where you start seeing a lot of fakes or you start seeing things where it's like, wow, that's on that matrix. I've never seen something like that. And there's a lot of really incredible fakes. I mean, for those of you that may follow uh, Mendat news and even social media news, there is an entire deposit of material found of hemimorphite and they thought it was really nice blue and it ended up being this whole big discussion on whether or not it was real or not. And people had bought all these things and ended up being dyed. So that's a whole presentation in itself as far as fake minerals go and what to look for. But this starts getting into that territory. So that's why we included it, because you can see the natural progression of reconstructing something and then making fakes, right? So <laughs> you got to be very, very careful. But this is the most extreme uh, that you're going to get for your prepping your specimens. Uh, and then, sorry, go ahead, Alex. I was just saying Frankenstein minerals. I see those on eBay a lot too. It's like, wow, oh, yeah. <laughs> all 20 of those minerals occurring on the same specimen. That's crazy. And so lastly is the post clean. So even though you have cleaned your specimens, you've prepped your specimens, it is really important to remember that it doesn't stop there. How many collections that I've been into that have just been coated in dust, coated in cigarette soot, uh, different things of that manner. So it's important to kind of have a schedule or have something, and this just goes back to the labeling, good practice, uh, which is always be sure to clean. You can use dusters, you can use paintbrushes. You can see this is the museum staff using a vacuum and paintbrushes just to be very with delicate specimens. Um, but again, it's important to clean. It's always important to make sure you maintain so that years later you don't have to do extra work because of that. Um, also, it's important to note that some specimens you may never even be able to clean. This whole presentation wouldn't even matter. Uh, the bisolite from uh, Northern Virginia, pff, good luck. You're not ever gonna clean that. So that's stuff you can't do. There's certain things that you can't clean. So to always keep that in mind. So really this post cleaning maintenance becomes extra important. And one good way to do it is what they do at museums. Keep it either in a display case to prevent the dust, because it always, the dust will go on your case, or two, if you know you don't have space for a case, invest in some flats or something. Put it in something that doesn't allow it to get coated with dust or something like that. But if you can't, then just make sure you clean it or you keep it maintained, because that's, that's a big deal. So. Again, something very simple, but something very important to end the note on everything because 
it doesn't stop after cleaning and going through all those acids. And the last thing you want to do is go through and maybe you have like a scolocyte or a mesolite and you've completely in a situation where hell the hell you're going to clean that up, right? With all the dust in it. So if you try to do it, you may damage it further. And that's the whole important part, right? You don't want to damage it further. But with that, I know we've went over, but I know that we normally do that with these types of discussions. Uh, if there's any other questions or anything that people have, we'll be happy.